Do me a favor, pause this right here and grab your AR. Go ahead, I'll wait. Go ahead and crack open your AR and remove the buffer. Now, do you know what this little weight actually does in your gun? What happens if you take a shot without your buffer in your rifle? The gun will fire, but nothing after that. And when I say nothing, I mean you're in for the next hour dealing with a whale of a time trying to awkwardly remove your BCG out of your buffer tube. That's if the back of the buffer tube doesn't blow out in the first place. The buffer system is one of the most critical parts of your rifle. Not just for the cycle of operations either, but for how your entire rifle feels and performs. Today, we're going to talk about the pure mechanics of the buffer assembly, how we got the buffer we use today, and some of the options you can consider while you're thinking about upgrading your AR down the road. The buffer system we know today has a lineage that starts with the original platforms. The basic concept began with the OG Papa Eugene Stoner's AR-10 rifle builds, which involved the system used in the 20-inch M16A2. The original rifle buffer design proved adequate for initial lower cyclic rates. However, the introduction of ball powder increased how quickly the rifle could fire, leading to critical malfunctions known as bolt carrier bounce. Bolt bounce is where the bolt slightly unlocks during consistent action, causing light strikes. This challenge necessitated immediate introduction of the standard rifle buffer in 1968, which utilized internal steel weights and rubber discs to absorb the recoil and prevent bolt carrier oscillation, thereby ensuring reliable function. The rifle buffer worked by having its mass contained in a long, heavy tube built for consistency across a wide range of operational environments. This set the standard for how the action was slowed down and returned to battery. As barrels and gas systems got much shorter, the modern AR-15 carbine buffer became dominant. This is where we see the carbine buffer tube at a shorter seven and a quarter inches. The crucial difference is that the engineers realized they needed a faster, more adaptable system for those newer, shorter rifles. Today we have the modern AR platform and the three-part assembly, tube, buffer, spring, each of which has specific functional characteristics. First up, the receiver extension, or what you've probably heard called the buffer tube. Its length is either the carbine, seven and a quarter inches, or the rifle length, about 10 inches. This dictates the corresponding length of the spring and the buffer. Knowing this length is crucial because when you're shopping around for parts, the components must fit precisely inside their preferred function. Next, there is the buffer itself. The buffer is that weighty thing inside the buffer tube, which provides the mass to help slow the BCG down. The carbine buffer is what you will see most of. Its mass is adjusted by weights inside. Standard buffers use three steel weights, which weigh about three ounces. Moving to the H1, H2, or H3 replaces these steel weights with denser tungsten weights to increase the total mass, which is a mechanical solution to control the cycling speed. But we'll get into why we need different weights in a little bit more detail later, so stick around. Finally, there is the spring. The spring is what really helps slow the BCG down as it comes back, but then it has enough tension to propel and slam the bolt back into battery. The spring's life is finite. After thousands of compressions and decompressions, the harmonic waves reverberate through the spring and can damage and compress the metal over time, causing it to lose its length, a condition known as spring set. When a spring loses its length, it loses its tension, leading to inconsistent cycling and ejection issues. If you want to learn how to properly diagnose your spring to make sure it's still within spec, you can check out this video over here. So now we know all the parts of the buffer system, but how and why does it work? At its most basic form, your buffer and spring will have two absolutely critical jobs that complete the cycling of the rifle, both tied directly to the gas system. Let's talk about the cycle of operations really quickly. I'm not going to go super in depth because Josh already did a whole video on it right here that you can check out. So let's cover just the basics at a high level. So first you pull the trigger, sending the bullet down the barrel. As the bullet passes the gas port, gas is delivered through the gas tube into the bolt carrier group or the BCG. 
This pressure forces the BCG to begin moving rearward, which first rotates and unlocks the bolt from the barrel extension. So the first big job the buffer has to do is absorb and decelerate. After the gas system unlocks the bolt and sends the BCG rearward, the buffer's primary job is to act as a shock absorber. It absorbs the kinetic energy from the BCG, slowing this group down after it has ejected a spent casing and traveling just far enough rearward to clear the magazine and allow a fresh round to feed. To get a better idea, let's look at what's going on here with the spring. The spring's job is to absorb that energy and then push the buffer and the BCG forward into battery, locking the BCG into place and chambering a fresh round. So if our spring doesn't have enough energy, then it fails to chamber a fresh round. Or worse, if it has too much energy, it's slamming the bolt face into the chamber and then causing damage to the bolt carrier group, leading to things like bent locking lugs or something even worse than that. The entire system is a continuous cycle of stopping and starting. That happens in a fraction of a second. And it is the buffer's mass and the spring's tension that control the speed and that cycle. The weight of the buffer is the primary tool for tuning that cycling speed. The right spring and buffer combo is an intricate balancing act based on the amount of gas that your rifle is cycling. So if your new build is giving you cycling issues, this might be the first place to start troubleshooting. Out of the box AR-15s are often over gas because manufacturers need to build their ARs to work in a variety of different temperatures, pressures, and ammo types. This means too much gas pressure is sent back to the BCG in a lot of over-the-counter complete builds. This overgassing can lead to issues like violent extraction where the spent casings are flung out with excessive force. Josh was telling me how he had a buddy whose rifle did violent extraction and it literally was like someone whipping the brass out of his gun to the ceiling. It just felt terrible. It could also lead to incorrect ejection pattern where casings are ejecting forward at the one or two o'clock position rather than the correct four or six o'clock position. My least favorite is the increased recoil impulse though, meaning your rifle could feel rougher or more jarring as the kinetic energy is thrown back into your shoulder. The buffer mitigates this through its mass. When you use a heavier buffer like an H2 or an H3, you are physically adding mass to the system. This extra mass absorbs more kinetic energy and slows down the cycling speed. A slower, more controlled cycling leads to a much smoother feeling gun, softer recoil impulse, and faster sight recovery for follow-up shots. Conversely, you could run into some trouble if your buffer is too heavy. Let me tell you a story real quick. I was in Canada this summer helping film a documentary about Canadian gun culture with our friends at American Marksman when our hosts were troubleshooting a schoolhouse AR not cycling properly. The guys at the schoolhouse didn't have a ton of experience behind the AR platform since they spent most of their time working with bolt guns. After a while, they asked Josh and me to help them out. Turns out they were using a buffer that was way too heavy for their gas gun and it was short stroking on them, meaning the bolt was not going far back enough to pick up a fresh round. So using a buffer that is too heavy leads to the gas system not having enough oomph to push the BCG and buffer weight far enough rearward. The rifle will short stroke like it did for us in Canada, resulting in an ejection but no feeding or the failure to eject altogether. So now we know how we got the basic mil-spec buffer system and how it works. But over the years, there have been many design upgrades to the system by third-party companies. These upgrades are usually targeted at reducing recoil, sound, or giving us shooters ways to tune our guns. Let's talk about some of those upgraded parts real quick. Let's go into a newer system with old roots, the hydraulic buffers. These replace some or all of the mass of the buffer with hydraulic fluid, similar to a dampening system. Unlike a solid weight buffer that just slows the action down by increasing mass, the hydraulic unit dampens the kinetic energy over a longer period of time, with a piston being driven into hydraulic fluid. This mechanical absorption, instead of pure mass absorption, creates a soft, very smooth feeling and significantly reduces the felt recoil impulse. 
You have a few options for these, including these Kinshot hydraulic buffers that have different sizes and weights depending on the caliber you're shooting, like 300 blackout and 9mm options, for example. But a fun fact is that Colt tried designing a buffer like this back in the day, but decided not to because of budget constraints. There goes the military, saving money again. Next, there's adjustable weight buffers. These, like the Odinworks system, allow the user to swap out tungsten and steel weights on the fly without buying three different buffers. The core difference is modularity. A mil-spec buffer is a fixed weight. The adjustable buffer allows you to quickly tune the rifle for different ammo loads or conditions, such as shooting suppressed, for example. These buffers can help achieve the perfect balance of mass and gas mitigation out at the range. I like using these when I have a new gun and I have a guess as to what weight I should be using, but I'm not 100% sure. Having one of these in my bag has bailed me out once or twice because I can just throw this in my gun and swap out the weights until the cycling action feels just right. The weights also give you way more options than the standard buffer. So if you are tuning your gun and you need to fine tune the buffer weight to go along with something like an adjustable gas block so your gun feels as smooth as possible, then this is the way to go to. Next, we have the silent captured systems. These systems integrate the buffer and the spring into a single enclosed multi-stage unit. The key difference from the mill spec is the elimination of the spring twang. In a standard system, the spring rubs and vibrates against the buffer wall, creating noise and inconsistent vibration. The key difference here is sound mitigation. You see here, when the buffer and the spring are going back and forth, you can see this spring move slightly within the buffer tube. What that does is create noise that we, the shooter, can hear after firing or even after just racking the gun a couple of times. This system was created to mitigate that spring twang sound that gets super annoying. The captured system eliminates this by containing the spring on a guide rod, making the rifle much more enjoyable to shoot and more consistent as it returns into battery. JP originated this design and there have been others that have iterated on it since, like the Arma spec. This is the creme de la creme of buffers, so if you want the smoothest, highest end options for buffers, then these are the way to go. None of these upgrades are changing the core function of your buffer, but now the next time you take that buffer out, you understand the function of that little weight and spring. Understanding the function of each component means you understand the rifle's action itself. The buffer assembly is one of those first places to look when tuning a rifle because a change of a single ounce can completely change the function of your AR. But there's a lot more upgrades out there than just upgrading your buffer, like upgrading your spring, but are they really worth it? Well, you can go ahead and check out this video right here where I talk all about cheap versus expensive buffers and springs and investigate if they're really worth it. You can go check that out over there. Where the bolt would significantly unlock, bolt bounce, it's like this rubber thing and those weights. Hear those? That's what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I'm just playing with it like I would normally do, but okay, I'll set it down. Have a good day, Jesus. Have a good day, Jesus. Whatever the fucking magic uh, spell is. Wingavian levitator, whatever it is. Okay.